myself. Um, I'm James Ball. I'm the special projects editor of The Guardian, and in a former life, I was data editor of The Guardian. So in theory, I'm meant to know a little bit about this stuff. In practice, compared to these guys, nothing. Um, so, less from me and more from everyone else. From, from my left to my right, we have Rufus Pollock, who is the president and founder of Open Knowledge, which is a pretty brilliant international NGO, which looks at sort of open data, the potential for it, how to use it, <coughs> how to get the benefits out of it. Is that a fair way of characterizing it? Very fair. So, we then have uh, Pali Mahola. Is that, is that right? Mm, you've mutilated my name. I'm very sorry. Badi <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, that's fine. I apologise profusely. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no, he is please. the uh, statistician general of uh, South Africa and just obviously a brilliant person to have on a panel like this and is in your 15th year? Yes, 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 yes. So, impressive. <laughs> so, my right is Elizabeth Stewart, who is a research fellow here at the ODI and is, as I said, the lead author of the report we're discussing today. And then we have uh, Francesco Durazio of Pulsar. So, uh, at least I got one roughly right. <laughs> I'm so terrible with those. So, um, who... Um, what? I've completely lost Social myself. media monitoring. We analyze social media, social media data. Yeah. Thank you very much, Francesco. So, so I'm going to kick straight off as we have an incredibly tight schedule with lots of sort of video people coming in and so on. So I'm going to kick straight off to Liz and ask her, firstly, what would you say the key findings of your report are and what are the priorities for action from it? Um, you can hear me. Thanks, thanks very much. And you've pronounced my name perfectly correctly, so thank you for that. Yeah. So um, the main findings <laughs> are... <laughs> The main findings were um, kind of hinted by um, the title of the report. We talk about the missing millions. So um, the key findings were uh, that lots of things that we think we know about development, we really don't know. And things that we think we know because they're data, right? They're, they are what we think of as being grounded in empirical reality are actually very often um, estimations, extrapolations, interpolations, so using complex different methodologies which don't <coughs> give us the level of accuracy that we think that they do give us. So the missing millions specifically is referring to the number of people um, living in, um, in around the world um, in vulnerable populations who are missed out of household surveys. Um, and if you, if you take that number 350 million, which, you know, we, it's an estimation, right? We, we, we are, let's take it as granted that any of the numbers we discussed today are basically estimations because that's the whole premise of the paper. But if that's right and there are 350 million people who are literally uncounted, uh, then that means our poverty numbers are out by a quarter, more than a quarter, something like that. So that's a pretty significant finding. Um, other things that we think we know about international development are also um, subject to the same kinds of margins of errors, and these are big margins of errors. So um, the number of children attending school, that could be um, understated or, or, or overstated by um, more than 10%. Global child mortality figures for 2030, they could have been underestimated, understated by 40%. Um, there's been new calculations that have been published in The Lancet looking at um, HIV instances that could have been overstated globally by 20%. This is, you know, this is big, big gaps in our, in our data knowledge in the things that we think we know. So that was, that was the biggest finding. Um, I think the, the, the good news, the good part of it is um, that actually the data revolution that the title also talks about, this is this new a sort of a, a deluge or an influx of innovative ways of using data, of making data, um, and of people being able to access this data, new um, kind of communities being opened up to data for the first time, that this is actually happening, and it's happening in some of the poorest countries around the world. So the, the report looks at, um, we've got case studies from um, low-income countries, from middle-income countries, a great one from Colombia, we've got instances in India, sub-Saharan Africa, across Asia, of, um, of people being able to use data in a different way to actually deliver tangible impacts for people's lives. So those are the main findings. In terms of what needs to be done next, what do we need to do to make sure that this data revolution um, keeps going and uh, happens more quickly, and also that the benefits of this data revolution accrue not just to an elite few, but to the 
vast number of people, and, and particularly to the poorest and most marginalised populations who, in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals, these are the very people that governments need to be able to reach with um, policy provisions, with services, to lift them out of poverty. How do we make sure that this data revolution delivers for them? So, I mean, the first answer is, unsurprisingly, uh, investment. Um, again, there's a good news story there as well, which is we're not talking about particularly <laughs> large sums of money to be able to make the difference. About a billion dollars a year is what's required to be able to monitor the SDGs. And remember, we, when we say to monitor them, a lot of this data is also about delivering the SDGs. If governments don't know their populations, it's very difficult to provide services to them in a, in a systematic way. And, you know, a billion dollars a year, that's globally. Um, McKinsey's sites, data from Kenya, um, that having introduced um, open procurement um, processes, they're saving a billion dollars a year. So that's just one country saving a billion dollars a year. Um, so I think it's quite clear that a data revolution could pay for itself. How should this money, what's the priorities for investing this money? There's four, if I've got time, four. Got just right, I'll be, I'll be quick. Four things. First one is um, civil registration and vital statistics. That's birth and death registries. More than 100 countries in the world don't have them at the moment. And they're vital for knowing what's going on in your population. Second is improving um, household surveys. So making sure that we don't miss these 350 million people but also making sure that they're done in a much more timely way. Too often we've got um, sort of data deserts. You have a, a number of years where we don't have data from a country, whereas countries like Indonesia at the moment is experimenting with a, continuous, a system of continuous household surveys. Um, we need to make sure as well that the, the household surveys are asking the right questions. Too often the kind of um, issues that they're looking at are not what you need to know to, to be able to monitor the SDGs. They're not what you need to know. They're not the key development questions. So household surveys need to look at things like women's ownership of land, for instance, and much more questions which are much more fundamental to development. Um, you need to invest the money in better administrative data, so kind of hospital records, things like that. And then finally, you need to invest in the capacity of the national statistic offices. Not all of them are as amazingly endowed as South Africa's national statistics office. Um, so, um, for instance, Malawi and Mali, a fifth of staff, have no statistical training whatsoever. We conducted a small-scale survey of um, people based in line ministries in a range of developing countries. And respondents said to us things like, um, I'm literally the only person in the office who has any stats training, or I'm the only person who knows how to use SPSS or Stata, computer, computer programs for analyzing <coughs> data. So those are, the, those are the priorities for investment. Thank you very much. So the key issue in this is essentially we're missing people. You know, we don't know how reliable our statistics are. You're sort of one of the people working at the coalface of this, the rough end of it. What's the difficulties in getting people registered in, sort of producing these? You know, what's the challenges that you face and what are you doing about them? Well, there are two ways in which you try to collect the data, roughly. One is door-to-door um, -door household service censuses. The other is uh, occurrence-based. When the children get born, they get to be registered. Um, the latter is much more efficient and effective, but uh, you've got to have an infrastructure for it. You've got to have hospitals. Uh, if children are born at home, there must be an infrastructure for registering them. If people die, there must be an infrastructure for registering them. There are cultural problems around uh, registration of children. The name has to be assigned, and it takes long to do so. Um, with the technology that is available, uh, movement of data uh, can replace movement of documents and people. And I think uh, that's the big advantage that we might have. So in that respect, I think the technology is there and the, the will to, to do so should be there. I mean, if you look at uh, um, electronic passports as well as uh, machine-readable passports, when the world was uh, terrorized, they decided that we'll use machine-readable passports. Uh, what's complex about registering children? Uh, there, there shouldn't be anything that is complex. It's a uh, political will and... Mm removing the, the, the barriers and the cultural thoughts and uh, ensuring that they are as important as us. So the, them and us syndrome is the main problem uh, inhibiting us from moving into civil registration and uh, vital statistics, which can be an easier way of dealing with uh, data. 
Looking at the censuses, which of course you have to run, because your vital registration system doesn't tell you the household <laughs> environment, whereas the service tell you how households are organized. So we need to move in there as well, in the censuses. But it shouldn't take this long to deliver the results of a census. Uh, two years, we pride ourselves. One year, we say we have broken the record. Uh, with these gadgets, we should be able to replace paper so that when you are in a household registering, the data is thrown up into a server, and then within two months, you have actually delivered the results. And I think that's where the innovations uh, should be uh, in the interim, uh, as we are not using internet-based uh, censuses. I think we are still a long way from there. Uh, I thought I wanted to just move into the, the, the difficult divide, and I needed my slides. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll be able to see uh, from here. Uh, my eyes. Uh, um, first slide. The, the, the digital divide, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a problem of people controlling and managing things in ways that do not benefit others. And I'll show you one of the things that uh, what we have there, it's a Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient of many things. Uh, for instance, if we look at cell phone access in South Africa, that's the Gini 36.36. Uh, uh, if you look at, um, I, I hope I'm not able to see uh, those lines. If you look at uh, television, 0.43. If you look at people accessing post office, 0.57. If you look at income, it's a uh, much bigger, 0.6. And if you look at mobile internet, 0.79 computers 0.85 and uh, landlines 0.99. Really? Uh, now, if you were to solve the problem, you need to actually move that uh, mobile internet, push it towards access to cell phones, and you will have solved the problem. And it shouldn't take that much to do so. And uh, of course, uh, there are people who have um, Broad, I mean, it's a matter of getting broadband, but uh, there are so many landlords in the internet, in the electronic systems, uh, that are blocking us from doing the necessary. Um, well, if you look at, uh, of course, we are in the, in the UK, and I thought that uh, I have to talk about uses and uses of statistics. Uh, and the, the best place to talk about this is the UK, bills of mortality from late 16th century, about the registration of deaths. Uh, registration of deaths. Uh, Florence Nightingale uh, discovered uh, antibiotics by saying that uh, people die more in hospitals than they die in the field of war. So keep them at the field of war because they'll not die. And because they and you can see the reemergence of. Kids of Sally Clark uh, who died a tragic death in 2007 after she was accused of killing her children. Mido said, uh, one death, it's a, it's a tragedy, two is suspicious, and the third death, it's murder. And he didn't use statistical theory and uh, thought that uh, these are independent events, yet seeds actually, using Bayesian statistics and Laplace uh, uh, formulas, actually it uh, tells you that your priors, prior probabilities, now in the light of what you know, actually suggests that the deaths were more likely in Sally's case. Now, uh, if you take uh, the, the lotto by Kathy and Kathleen, uh, David and Kathleen, the question is, uh, do the priors uh, apply? I mean, uh, what is the likelihood that they can win the lotto twice in a year? You cannot use the same uh, Bayesian theory to look at that because the, those events are quite independent, whereas the deaths uh, 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 of, uh, of death courts uh, 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 can be very related. And then, of course, uh, yesterday or two days ago, I saw that they say Filipino has been arrested for killing uh, <laughs> some patients, and there are 11 more to come. So application of statistics is very, very important. If it's misused, it can lead to the disaster that uh, uh, Sally Clark actually suffered. Uh, so, uh, well, Stalin says, one death is a tragedy, one million is a statistic. And of course, uh, we've got to see what we have got to do with statistics. So in con what I could conclude is that statistics are important, handled in the bad hands, like uh, Dr. Professor Meadows. He had power and everything. They can be very dangerous.
So it on is. that cheerful note, thank you, yeah. thank you for that for those introductory <laughs> comments. So Francesca, I'm going to come to you now, and sort of we've been talking a bit more about some of the traditional sort of challenges, and there's some very fundamental challenges in this area. So what I'm interested in is sort of what can sort of some of the more you know less traditional techniques, sort of the big data social media, bring to this. Is is this something for down the line, or is there sort of real practical cases now? I'm glad I'm wearing a red shirt to connect to Stalin. <laughs> you know, nice association after. I'm also the bad guy here today, probably because I work in the private sector and we uh, work for this company called Pulsar. We apply data science to uh, social media data, and so in a way, I deal with data that you guys probably find uh, fairly irrelevant, but or less solid than the data that you are currently dealing with, and we. Um, kind of uses data for analyzing perceptions, opinions, behavior, and over the years we've seen that you can actually extract uh, pretty kind of like solid inferences out of uh, indicators that can be pretty light, such as the willingness to go to an event or uh, the fact that you're connected to a set of different people online it says a lot about who you are and how you're going to behave next. So. Um, over the years, we've been working a lot with private companies, but also with um, government organizations. And um, I'm going to uh, give you a few examples of companies that have been doing interesting stuff with social data and organizations that have been doing great things with it. For example, the uh, Food Standards Agency in the UK, they uh, use social data for predicting when the next um, influence outbreak is going to spread. So they correlate the can I just uh, quickly ask if you can move close to the mic? Yes. Sorry. So we've got people... Oh, I thought it wasn't working at all. Yeah. So the FSA um, does this really interesting um, kind of like ongoing study where they correlate mentions of norovirus and the symptoms connected to norovirus to lab reports because they've got that data. So they can align the people that actually uh, are recognized as uh, having caught the, the virus with the people that are actually mentioning or searching for information about it. And they uh, came up with a model that can predict with a 75% accuracy rate the uh, kind of like next outbreak of a case in uh, in specific regions of the UK. Um, they also use this data when it comes to analyzing perceptions, for example, to understand how to tackle uh, challenges such as communicating what are the best remedies or the best symptoms or the nature of a virus. So when they did the first study on norovirus, what they realized is that uh, most people in the UK were discussing in connection to the remedies that they were planning to use to fight the virus. And one of the interesting and shocking discoveries that they made is that the most common remedies were things like garlic soup or thyme or um, uh, red onions. And, um, and, uh, and that obviously opened the whole new kind of like universe of uh, campaign strategies for them to try and, and connect with an audience that was talking about uh, a virus that they're supposed to be uh, educating the audience about in, a, in the right way. Um, Department of Health in the UK, again, uh, has been using social data for tracking the spread of Ebola and um, looking at correlation of real cases and mentions in social media or kind of like people searching for information about it. Uh, the Competitive Markets Authority in the UK, again, is interesting because they've been looking at um, hidden um, airline fees. So they've been looking at people mentioning uh, uh, being frustrated with hidden airline fees with a bunch of different uh, airline companies that were selling tickets and trying to like, kind of like regulate the industry from the bottom up rather than from the top down instead of like going to the source of the problem and checking what the, the different kind of like airlines are doing, which are obviously doing as well. What they were, they were doing was um, tracking people mentioning experiences that they had with the different airline companies, which is an interesting way of applying regulation in, uh, in the opposite way that is normally done. Um, or um, the Department for uh, Foreign International Trade in um, uh, Canada uh, uses social data for mapping uh, crises in the Middle East. Obviously, in uh, countries where the press is less free than, than it is in, uh, uh, in the UK or in countries where you don't have the Daily Mail, uh, they, um, 
they 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 re people rely on social media a lot more than they than they rely on uh, on the official channels and, and so monitoring the tr the social media channels can be a really insightful source of information on what's happening on the ground um so this is all kind of like uh, great ways of using this data, uh, but from what I've read in the report, there's also a lot of kind of like, uh, apart from the skepticism, there's also a lot of fear within the uh, within the sector, but also in the research, market research sector is pretty much similar in that respect. People are afraid that the whole world of big data and the idea of passive collection and real-time data is going to replace what uh, the traditional methods have been doing, and I think that's completely wrong, because if anything, these methods are going to be complementary. And one of the reasons why they're being complementary is because the, the data that we're collecting as, uh, and big data in general has many flows. For example, big doesn't necessarily mean whole. Uh, big doesn't mean representative. Uh, the data that people share on social media is a bit like fashion. People want to be seen wearing the words that they use. So they're very biased types of behaviors and information that people expose online. Uh, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. And, um, and, and, and more than anything, the data that we're seeing online is qualitative data on a quantitative scale, so it needs to be treat, <coughs> treated like that, because we haven't got the kind of like uh, precision that you can have when you're uh, kind of like surveying a specific population, sampled in a specific way. So you need to approach this data in a slightly different way than you'll be approaching traditional methods. And that's why you can bring the two together. So, cool. Thanks very much. So, and last but by no means least, Rufus, um, I'd like to kind of just push you a little on the question of open. I mean, is, is open kind of a luxury to go at the end when we've got the quality of the statistics up, when we've dealt with these fundamental challenges? You know, what's, what's the case for considering it at this stage? Mm. Great. Thank, thank you. No, thank you. So, um, first of all, those just who don't know me, I'm, I'm Rufus Pollock from Open Knowledge, which is decade old now a uh, non-profit and headquartered here but operating internationally that has as its mission to open up all essential public interest information um, and see it used to create insight that drives change um, and so this kind of information is right at the heart I mean this is much of this <coughs> data leaving aside we'll come to a moment the kind of personal aspect much of the valuable statistics in the world certainly some of the most important come from personal information but when aggregated are clearly essential public interest and don't have that, that issue. Um, so I think the question you're asking here is, 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 is openness a luxury? I mean, in one sense, I can, it's wonderful. I mean, uh, congratulations on the report. I um, mean, in, in it, several of the key suggestions are about opening up uh, data sets. And I think there's, so the answer very simply to you is, of course, no. Um, that's why you gave me the question is, no, it's not a, it's not a luxury. Um, several reasons. I mean, the, the first point is simply of the data we already have, um, which is often very costly to collect, however we do it, um, it's absolutely essential we're able to make best use of it. I mean, there's a great example in here about the World Bank's uh, database of household surveys, um, page 28 of the report, if you haven't looked at it. Um, um, you know, we've already spent probably, you know, millions, if not tens of millions or hundreds of millions collecting <coughs> this kind of data. It is, it is crazy that this is not uh, open and as widely available as possible. Um, to people, uh, researchers everywhere, citizens themselves. So one is just a straightforward kind of efficiency and effectiveness of the data we already have. Um, I think the other is the kind of feedback, uh, the, the feedback mechanism. When we open up information, um, and by the way, so when I say open, that means freely available to anyone for any purpose, including commercial. And I think that's really important. Great work is being done. There is all kinds of commercial applications or use of this information. And the tools that we might want to use, even if we have no interest in commercial, the kind of tooling that we might be able to use often comes from the commercial sector. So it's really open, doesn't just mean it, it's even publicly available, it's free for anyone to use for any purpose. Um, so one is the efficiency of, of the data we already have, but I think the other is around um, quality and about transparency that, and what that drives. I think there's some really great other examples of, of, in the report um, opening up procurement information. Um, you gave an example about uh, Kenya McKinsey report, but also the Costa Rica example you gave in the report, um, where opening up oh, procurement oh, um, led to the fact that people realized, okay, most of the contracts are going to only 20 families in Costa Rica, most of public procurement. Um, I've got a microphone speaker problem, I think, on that. Um, um, so, 
I think there's also an aspect that opening up this data leads to all kinds of other uses that we wouldn't expect. I think that's one of, um, just as we're using, I think, sentiment analysis or, or other so social media could inform really important basic statistical questions we ask about the world. How many people are in poverty? What are they doing? What's important to them? Um, conversely, there are unexpected uses of this data the other way around. And opening it up also allows for those unexpected uh, unexpected uses. So I think openness uh, and open data in this regard is really invaluable and, 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 and in a way goes to the heart of the, the statistical tradition we've had. Um, it was the kind of thing that you could always, you could go and look up births, marriages and deaths at Somerset House. Um, it was a constant uh, frequent house of Sherlock Holmes and his, if, and his stories <laughs> often was that he could go there and find things out. Um, so this idea that these kind of standard information should be available uh, to us and to the public. And in a sense, we've lagged behind the advance of technology. Um, you know, you often can go and sometimes find this in particular places. If you had access to the right almanacs, um, you, could, you could find this out. But we're in a digital age. Um, and I think that aspect is the openness reflects that. And I think, so in summary, I think the, there are very strong arguments uh, and reasons that public money pays for this data to be collected. It has immense public value to all kinds of actors, from researchers here to other academics, um, to citizens themselves, to activist organizations, through to, to business. And, we, and all of those reinforce and support each other.